so I believe we are live on the 6 Plus Plus channel with another episode of Bugwatch. I am Davey, I'm your hype master, Tyranid Extremo, um, and uh, yeah, or oh, aka your boy Swissly, aka Fun Sponge, <laughs> still living that dream. Um, and we, we, we're bringing you an episode today about terrain. I'm very excited to uh, to share this with you. We think it's, I think it's a really important thing. I thought it was a really great topic of conversation. When we have people come into our Discord, put lists in, uh, my first question to them every time is, what terrain are you playing on? Because I just think it's so important within list building. But first, let's introduce you to some of our guests, because I've brought some really intelligent powerful people uh, to, to come and talk. <laughs> Where's he found them, <laughs> Where are they? Talk the rain with you. Um, first up, we have our Invasion Fleet Warrior, JP. How is it going, JP? I'm doing very well. Loving, loving myself some Invasion Fleet, although from the look of the list from this weekend, I might be uh, having to investigate some Swarm at some point. I was about to say that meme of, you know, the guy with the girlfriend and the other girl walking past. Yeah. Your, your girlfriend is Invasion <laughs> the, the other girl is an unending Swarm, for sure. Yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still high on Invasion Fleet because as much as I, I do love Swarm, I do think it's a fantastic team's list. I've got to start to think about the singles events I've got coming up. So I'm curious to see how the weekend goes and then uh, kind of make my way as it goes from there. Awesome. Awesome. Good stuff. And we also have a very rare uh, appearance on uh, the Six Plus Plus channel. He's appeared on the channel before on the actual show itself. Uh, but a very rare appearance for a non tyranny player on Bugwatch. Uh, I, thought, I thought you was after Tyranid experts. That's why. I was <laughs> so I was like, well, to be fair, you probably know a lot more than uh, one, a lot more than people might suspect at first glance, uh, because this is indeed Team England's Jack Davis Fletcher. Um, I'm sure you'll be able to share bits of wisdom from some of the practice games. How's it going, Jack? You good? I'm good, thank you. I'm good, thank you very much. Uh, second time on Six Plus Plus, but first time on Bugwatch, so <laughs> new for me. Maybe I'll, uh, maybe this will get me. Uh, I don't know. Just think about another army. We all love a new hyper, uh, hyper, uh, hyper obsession, you know. Oh yeah. Hyper absolutely. fixation. It's like, oh, should I just should I <clears throat> paint eighty gargoyles? I, I, I could do that in a week. <laughs> no, 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 don't do no, that. No, don't don't, don't really do that to yourself. It's a dark obsession to get man. <laughs> It really is, because not only do you need to, like, when I painted um, 120 termagants in two weeks, I think my brain was going to explode. Uh, but also, there's just so many data sheets. Like, you're like, okay, I need three maliceptors, and I need three exocrines, and I probably need uh, a couple of um, tyrannifexes, and then I need hive tyrants, because there's so many different types of hive tyrants. Yes. Yeah, it all gets a bit much. It all gets a bit much. <laughs> But yeah, cool. Um, so no, thanks for coming on, Jack. Really appreciate it. it is, as I said, it's a bit like Terrain Week on uh, Six Plus Plus. <laughs> uh, this show certainly follows up on the guys' show yesterday. Uh, if, if you if you haven't watched that, the Six Plus Plus show yesterday was a, it was a great chat around terrain. They go over um, a, a few a couple more terrain sets than we will today. We're going to be going over the big three. Um, and if you want to find out a little bit more about uh, other people's views on terrain. By all means, go and watch that show. We're going to dig a little bit deeper today on what we think makes good Tyranid choices and good Tyranid lists on certain sets of terrain. Um, yeah, but of course, we're not the be-all and end-all of all knowledge, right? We're not absolute messiahs of 40k. So what we want to do is if you've got an opinion, if you've got any thoughts on uh, what's, what works well, what doesn't work well, please, please, please put it in the comments below. Put it in the chat. Uh, if you've got any questions about a terrain set, I'll be looking at the chat as we go, and as before we lock off that and we lock down that terrain set and move to the next one, we will uh, answer any questions in the chat. So please do get them in there. Um, cool. A couple of bits of admin before we start. Bugwatch is going to be posted live bi-weekly from now on, on Monday evenings. Um, and then in the other evenings, it's going to be Matchup Plus Plus. If you don't know Matchup Plus Plus, it's a great show we do, uh, where it's where they look at like a meta threat or something like that and figure out how do you beat it? What do you do? What works well against it? What are they going to try and do to you? And like how you can counter it and things like that. If you look at last week, they, um, Jack took everyone through Necrons. So they're definitely a watch at the moment because they are some nasty pasties over in the metal world. Um, some other cool shows to check out is Tom Lohman's Archon show that went up yesterday. Tom's done amazing recently. He won a GT, he won RTTs with, um, with um, 
Drakari, so Drakari, yeah. with a new detachment. Yeah, mm. so by all means, check that out. We also have a new YouTube membership platform, and a big thank you to Chris Mason and Dead uh, Dread Mad ninety three for becoming lieutenants. Much appreciated, guys. Really appreciate it. If you become a member, you get via like a VIP Discord area. You get to get uh, our non live shows a little bit earlier too, and some behind the scene content. Of course, oh, it's, it's behind the scene content from people such as Wales coach John Scrivens, uh, the ever belovable Tom Lohman, and of course myself. But I want, right, guys, serious, serious talk now, serious talk on membership. <laughs> I want Bugwatch to be the number one driver of memberships for this channel. I really do. So if you join Bug, if you join the membership today and you catch me at an event, I'll buy you a pint. Now, bearing in mind, <laughs> the membership is four ninety nine. A pint, I think, at a UT, UKTC event is at least what. Thirty-seven pounds. So I'll de- you'll definitely make a profit, right? I'm telling you. So join up today. Join up today. Um, and of course, just we also have a free Discord. So come and join that, and come and join the tyranny chat we have on there. It's great crack. We only want cool people, no knobheads. So get on there, put your list in, tell us what's going on. We love we love the chat. Cool. Um, just looking at the chat, we've got Scrivo saying hi, hi, hi. Thanks, Scrivo. You're such a legend. Um, Entropic Tyranny, another bug watch. You've made my day. Uh, Christopher Richardson saying he just made it in time. We waited for you, man. We waited. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and Dreadmad93 giving us a wave. Hello, Dreadmad93. And thank you for becoming a member. All right, let's crack on with the show. Let's get on with it. Boom. Right. So we're going to look at these terrain sets. We're going to talk about what works quite well. Um, first up, we're a, bit, a little bit biased over here. We're all in the UK. So we're going to talk about UKTC. Um, and find out a little bit more about this terrain set. Um, just top line, guys. How do we feel about UKTC terrain? You know, going to events, and what do you think of it? I'll let you go first, Jack, because uh, okay. you're the you're the special special guest. I'm just a guest now. Oh, I feel oh honored. God, you're killing me, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, UKTC. I used to I used to really be big on UKTC. Um, and it depends on what army I'm playing. So at the moment, I'm playing a lot of guard. And I can't hide my four indirect pieces without getting shot turn one. And my two oh, no. I know, right? <laughs> um, but, but there's a lot of firing angles. It, there's a, it's really good for shooting armies. Um, you can work a lot of armies like Tau and stuff can really see their, their win rates go higher than they can on other terrain sets, like maybe like GW or WTC. And, um, but I think overall, the fact that you know what terrain set you're playing on every month, if you go into a UKTC event, you can start planning your army around it. You know the mission pack, you know the missions, you can get really familiar with it. Um, half of that you can get bored maybe of the same missions, but also half of that is you can really utilize uh, the people that put in the practice and put in the reps of how they want to deploy their armies all the time can really push the most out of their performance, I think, on these events, uh, just because the terrain is always going to be the same and you know what to expect on it so you get so much practice and so many reps on this that actually um for those that are willing to put in the practice maybe on tts or in on like or in real life if they got uh access to the terrain it's it's really good for that i think super cool no i agree i agree jp what do you reckon yeah no i think um in a way jack's hitting the nail on the head with it um i think i think it's a positive like i i I'm kind of quite biased because literally the only events I play are UKTC right now. I've got a couple in the year. Um, I've got a couple of other ones in the year, and I do a couple of leagues, but they do use the UKTC format. Um, I think for I think it's a double-edged sword. So I think Jackbot identifies for those that have the time and can put all the reps in, and use TTS and in 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 real life, the the likes of the, your manners, your Vix, etc. Like you can really get an advantage over even other similar level players because you just have the time like for i i think if, for example if you put uh manny versus like a john lennon or a richard siegler on the same table on a uktc format manny's gonna have a massive advantage because they've just got so many reps on it and, and vice versa i'm sure the u.s terrain set's going to be a bit different as well but on the flip side of that and i think this is where the double-edged side of it comes in for those of us who don't have the same amount of time like family for example i i only do say four or five uktc events in a year i'll do a couple of leagues in my time in the week i just don't have the physical uh, time to put into these things having a set that is exactly the same is actually ideal because it means that when i need to start testing a new army so for example i picked up tyranids um the back end of last year in november 
I've played UKTC for the last couple of years now, so the, the train set's always been more or much for muchness. But the nice thing is me, if I want to develop a Tyranid list, a lot of my game focus is on testing out the things with Tyranids because the train set's the same and I know it. Not to the same level as, as your sort of your, your international players. But it means I'm not having to learn a new terrain set whilst also learning new armies. And if I want to try something, so for example, when I put the Maliceptors into my Tyranid list, I have a, a baseline to test that against. Like, I, I know how they should perform. I know how to use them, or in a, in a way, you know how to use them. But I'm testing the army, not testing the terrain set. And I think UKTC has really helped me develop as a player because I'm not having to go into each tournament thinking, right, what's the tournament? What's the terrain layout? Is it new? Is it different? The terrain layout is more or less the same, give or take a few changes. So I'm now testing the army, which has made a big difference for me when I don't have that time to put into it. And I think that's a big thing for any of these terrain sets that we'll go through that are very similar. But it's a much faster set. It's much faster in UKTC when you look, you, you go and you look at the packs and everything's mathematically measured out. Some of the yes. train pieces are at a half an inch, like 18 and a half inches. It's that precise measurement to make sure it is symmetrical and good for everyone. And I think that's helped me as a player develop. And I think for those people who don't have a lot of time, it helps a lot of people just get a game in and, and feel more comfortable playing against other people. Yeah, no, I agree. I think there's a... Um... I think that there is, as you say, a mathematical kind of certainty to the terrain. There's five missions, right? And each mission has a mid board that has two big L's and two little L's. Like, there's, that doesn't change. Like, there's, it doesn't matter. They're, they're going to might move to the flank or they might move in the middle, but those pieces are there. If you go to something like Peterborough Slam, which is a smaller event um, in Peterborough, you'll be surprised to know. Um, they have like terrain pieces that are. A little bit uh so they've got like the mid board might have four pieces of terrain or six even in one mm. of the missions but then in another mission it's only got like two and a bit and you kind of go oh wow actually that's that presents a real challenge to combat armies things like that but uktc there's that certainty of okay if i put something behind a piece of terrain there is somewhere it can move turn one in every single mission and there's something quite nice about that for newer players as well uh, and something quite reliable about that um just like when you're preparing as you say when you've got the terrain set at home you can just sit there and deploy and move and, and feel quite comfortable about it for those i suppose that don't know it uh yes as i mentioned before you can see on this picture i put on the on the show here you've got the big l which is always i think i don't think there's a mission in the uktc where the big l like the big piece in each corner is anywhere but your home objective i think it's on your home objective in every single first episode. mission is the first dawn of, war, not... dawn of war deployment it's in the corner oh yeah dawn of war and deployment. then the, but yeah. you still have one of the medium elves which is yeah. big enough to still hide, hide behind it a lot of stuff absolutely you can definitely hide lots of stuff there so you've got that safe uh home objective in every mission pretty much um and then as i say those all those other pieces are in the mid board uh, I, i'm gonna recite what the amazing tom lawman said yesterday on the show Basically, if you're in the center of the table or the center of the um, of your deployment zone or something like that, you can essentially project threat ranges from combat across the board pretty reliably. You can get to any objective almost if you've got like a fast melee army. Um, where shooting armies really benefit, like Jack mentioned before, is down the flanks. You can get some really good angles if you just push down the flanks and you get extra bonus points if you're really fast at shooting. So that's why Tau always have had that real impactful um shooting mm. uh and, and and win rate on uktc um it's as a result because of that shooting meta that um that, that jack mentioned durable units are the ones that really benefit so custodians tend to do very well on uktc um you know armies like that armies with a bit more durability anything with a four up involved and five up feeling the pain will do a-okay on the uktc um Cool. And then, yeah, as I say, a reasonably safe home objective. I've got notes here you haven't told. I think um, there's, a, there's a lot to think about. There's a lot to think about. So, yeah, I think... in, terms of, in terms of that kind of stuff, is there, is there any unit you guys can, uh, can think of with Tyranids that really benefit from playing on UKTC? Um, any monster that can move around the board, in my opinion. Um, I think one of the, well, I think it's more, it benefits kind of like your, um, your Norns and your Carnifexes. Because uh, I don't know whether uh, Jack may or may not agree with this, but one thing I have found on UKTC, it's incredibly easy to tow a tail into an, into a piece of terrain and get access to cover on monsters because of the way that the tenth edition rules change cover. Now you just need to have a fraction of the, you need to have a toenail that you can't see, you get cover. And the way the small L's 
and even the bigger, the medium and large ones, but mostly those small ones. It's very easy to tow like a Carnifex tail into the ruin, put it side on, get line of sight to something, and suddenly your two up monster still has cover from almost any angle on the board, minus being behind it. So the I think that uh, the sort of the two up save monsters have definitely benefited in a way, and I think that's why potentially you you'll you're seeing Custodies do quite well. You're seeing uh, like Land Raiders start to come back into it a little bit more because that two up saving cover is quite a big quite a big thing, and especially with Armour of Contempt and stuff. So I like that with UKTC. It does mean that you're not just getting blown off the board by your proverbial leaf blower list. Like You do have to make some effort to um, have enough AP to, to sustain the damage through, but it's kind of my feeling of it. It's quite forgiving. In that way, I think the best way to describe it is quite a forgiving terrain set. Mm -hmm. um, you're Even as a new player, you're not likely to get blown off the board turn one unless you deliberately put stuff in the open. There's enough terrain for that. But also, you can also position when you're a lot better. It's kind of that easy game to math, easy game to learn, but difficult to master when you start putting stuff at different angles and then you get that cover. Uh, I think that's where UK, UKTC does have quite a nice part to it. Yeah, absolutely. I think the two up armor monsters are, are winnable. Like, like I think Norns are very good mm. on this terrain set because you've got the five eternal pain, you've got the the armor save, so you're you're pretty happy. But I think it's really funny because monsters are either really well, pretty good or terrible. Like a Harris yes. on UKTC is a disaster as one because it's got a three up armor, if I remember rightly. Yes. And yeah, fourteen wounds. And can't be hidden. Like you, sure, it's going to get cover because you can put its tongue behind any piece of terrain on the board, nearly because it's so long. But in the end of the day, it's it's still just going to going to take a hit big time. And the other one, obviously, is winged hive tyrants. Winged hive tyrants mm. in ninth, big flex. Winged hive tyrants in tenth, oh. shocking because it can't yeah. go through terrain. <laughs> and then and it can't and hide. No, exactly. And just linking back to what you're saying about the norms, and I think this going to just thinking back to Nottingham when it was kind of very heavy. Um, Necron meta. There was no custodies. Two up save was at a minimum. Um, it was a lot more heavy on like three up save tanks. Uh, your, your wraiths go. So there was a lot more reason to have like AP1 ignores cover because a wraith going from a three to a four up save and a katan on a four up save, it didn't matter what your AP was. So it reminds me back to then where Nathan Roberts took the triple Norn list in Synaptic Nexus. Um, one, you out OC'd everything that sat on an objective, but you've got a two up save in cover with Armor of Contempt. And it really played off of that ability on UKTC to stand on an objective and just not ever die to half the meta. But now we're seeing a lot more of these Iron Storm lists where the AP has increased a lot more. Now a three up save in cover isn't good enough. Two up save in cover is kind of where you need to be. And I know Custody's got a lot of other rules in the background to it, but I do think they're just really hard to shift off with the amount of cover you can get easy access to. And I don't know, Jack, whether you want to nudge in on that with the testing you've been doing. No, I agree. I mean, there's a number of lists I've been talking to people today, and I think it's like four of us, right? Like me, Vic, Chris Kinnair, uh, we're all playing Dark Angels this weekend, and we've all got them, and they've all got triple redemptors with two up saves with a Dark Shroud nearby. So they get minus one to hit, and they get cover. So essentially, they're on a one-up save all the time. And and what we see in tenth is, is not as much AP as there was like in ninth, right? There's a lot of there's a lot of AP one, AP twos and stuff. You pop armor contempt and suddenly they're just still on two ups with minus one damage a lot of these stuff. And and that's the thing, if you can get these on monsters for Tyranids and stuff, and you can get a two up save, I think the difference between two up save and a three up save is so big. And you're right, yep. sticking that little tail into a, into one of the ruins, because even you look on the map here, everywhere from your deployment zone here is possible to get to another ruin quickly. Uh, or to at least get a part of your body to another ruin. So you're always basically going to be on a one-up save. And then you're saying, look, I'm like T10, T11, whatever you are, toughness. Have you got the facilities to kill me? And then when you do, can I just make four-up saves or whatever? Because if you're like AP3, I'm, I'm on a four-up still. And that's like 50% of the time you're you're saving that. Um, and realistically, one last cannon's not killing you with that. If, if they get that through, which you know some armies don't have that uh, the facilities to bring them down so i think monsters can really work uh really work well on this terrain uh so here's a question how long it took us so long to figure out two up armor and cover against no ap in the, in the entire game how could, it be, how could it took us so long to figure that out <laughs> probably i know probably because two up save just wasn't 
well, I suppose for a long time, like race guard just don't care about so oh, like the Ray P4. Mm -hmm. That's fair. They did, people I, just did dev wounds, didn't they? Before, yeah, people just did dev, dev wounds, wounds and, didn't care about that. No. Just do dev wounds, you don't have to worry about AP then. Yeah, very true. I very think, true. I think also like the, the, the stuff that does have easy access to two up saves, custodies being the number one, had a lot of inbuilt issues. Yeah. that have now been addressed, mostly the four-up save versus devastating wounds. Like you've got to bear in mind, with Chaos Space Marines being the best army in the game, two of those big platforms can access devastating wounds ridiculously easily, and custodians just walk in the open and go, I've got uh, no save. <laughs> and it's very easy to get rid of. Um, I think a lot of the sim is the symptom that a Chaos Space Marines going down probably is a big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, not not that they're going down, they're still a very powerful list, but just having less tools because they have their best stuff is a higher point. Eldari losing, for going away from the triple spinner with the devastating wounds and the Wraith Guard brick, now going into your, your Scourges and your uh, Shadow Spectres, where that AP, it's either single shot high AP, which can bounce off an inbun, or it's multiple shots which don't have the AP to go through. It's just, I think it's been a more of a shift in what is the meta versus the terrain you're playing on. And I don't know, Jack, it may, it may trigger into other terrain setups. I feel UKTC having access to a lot of cover, especially mid-board, helps those armies that want to kind of just tank damage. I think probably Tyranids are a great army for that, for tanking damage, because you, you're seeing these lists of maybe five to six monsters sitting behind a hundred small bodies putting pressure on you know, okay well i either have to kill these or i've got these big monsters and i can't kill both most a lot of armies struggle to kill both because there's this monster behind me an x screen looking at me and they're like oh they've got they got cover and stuff and they're gonna see me next turn i've kind of got to deal with them this turn right and they're good at killing like elite infantry uh and you're like oh but i've also got 20 gargoyles on my face or t like 10 like <laughs> oc like oc2 models or something mm -hmm. that are just on my face that i need to get rid of to score my primaries and I think you're right. I think it's a I think it's a meta shift with stuff like custodies and stuff becoming better, um, and having access to the extra rules that suddenly go well as custodies become more prevalent and they've got the two up saves and they're getting cover. A lot of other armies are going to shift to the same thing, um, and I think it, I think it literally is it's just as the meta changes things like so different units then become more prevalent. At the moment, we are kind of in that monster vehicle meta ish mm. you know at, or to up save elite infantry have you found in your just a, just a sort of side question to all of this have you found in the testing you've been doing in the run-up to all the team events then and, and this just be my appreciation of things we're starting to see maliceptors reappear not because they're good but because they counter the melee armies that have started because it feels to me like melee is a bit more prevalent than it was 100%. previously so yeah. when, when it was just Chaos Space Marines, like I would have two Maliceptors because I, um, yeah. I just found the CSM matchup was much easier mm -hmm. because Maliceptors just go, you hit on fours and the damage decrease goes off. It, it, you, I, I feel it's a shift because of the meta being more melee rather than the board being any different because if we were still in a, uh, a meta where shooting was a thing, I want to be playing more like Trigons versus Maliceptors, which can get blown off the board really quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you're right. I think there has been a shift towards melee. And then maybe that is through the custodes. And now you've got like Blood Angels and stuff popping up, Black Templars, Crusader Horde and stuff like that. There's a lot of there's a lot of melee out there. And again, maybe that is uh, a meta shift in, in the, the mid community to go, okay, well this is actually like a better data sheet to counter what's now coming out. Feels like it. Definitely feels mm. like it. Um, one of the things uh, w that, you know, one of the areas that this terrain set really kind of offers cut players is that threat projection. So if you look at this picture in the middle, for example, um, you've got um, the two little elves, which you can easily get a unit to turn one, and you can then project pretty much anywhere onto the board. So we've got like fast moving um, combat threats in our army. So we have Jane Steelers, Tyranny Warriors, both led by um, characters as well to give them synapse. So you can get across the board with things like that. Um, of course, in Vanguard Invader, you've got Advance and Charge, so that's also beneficial. You've got, even in uh, Invasion Fleet, you've got the Overrun strat. So one of the things that's quite interesting here is this is one of the few missions where the middle objective is not covered by any terrain whatsoever. So you can kill something on that objective and then jump off it behind the wall if you were so inclined with Overrun. Pretty good. 
Um, so that's nice. Just staying on that little piece of terrain as well, actually. If you have a Tervigan or a way to regen models, just get those Termigans behind that wall, baby, and then put one in front, let it die, and then regen it back onto the objective <laughs> in your command phase. Get those points. Um, is also a very nice nice thing to do. Um, the other thing is fast moving shooting. Um, we don't really have a solution for fast moving shooting. We've got exocrines which move eight, but they don't have uh, the infantry keyword obviously because they're monsters. So they can't really like go through terrain to make angles even better. So they've got to go the long way around. You can see like the I've got a couple of exocrines here. Uh, there's one on the left hand side which you can he can just move up and then get angles. 36 inch range covers a lot of the board, but not all of it. So you'd love to be a scourge or something like that that can just jump through the wall and jump back. But it is what it is. Um, the other thing I quite like about UKTC terrain, I don't know if you guys have done this before, um, is having a, like a shooting platform like an Exocrim um, behind the big L. So the big like terrain piece that's on your home objective. And if you can turn it sideways, you can actually just move eight and get any angle you want either side of that building regardless even though it's a big terrain piece and that mm -hmm. unlocks so many angles with an exocrine just kind of just moving back and forth to wherever you need to be just to get the angles you need um well the one, one... Of, oh, go on. Go on, one of the one of the the, the challenge the tyranids unfortunately run into the um have run into a bit of a problem more recently on uktc and the way it's the, and the setup and i think it's more it's a tyranid problem not a terrain problem um, eight inches just isn't enough to get a lot of angles. Um, for example, on this one specifically, um, the middle L on the right-hand side in sort of your opponent's deployment zone, you literally can't see anything in there yeah. for the first two turns unless you have to jump through a few hoops. So, for example, um, if you take the walking hive tyrant to give you assault to just give you the chance of getting around there, um, there is a big play. The, the, the exocrine that's on the top, the, the higher left, if that advances far enough, you can see into your opponent's deployment zone with an advanced move and the, and the walking hive tyrant. Um, but more and more and more, I just started out of strap reserving all my exocrines because drawing line of sight with it on UKTC can be incredibly hard only moving eight inches, whereas either having the hive tyrant or having strap reserve does give you a lot more movement to get to those lines of fire because the stuff that is a good shooting platform moves in other armies, for example, Tau moves 18 inches, which is a lot more than 8 plus D6. And I think that's where Tyranids have started to really struggle in the shooting meta, because the stuff that does have really good guns in other armies, Eldari, Tau, for example, either move ridiculously quickly, it was 18 inches, 12, 14, thinking of Scourges, Shadow Spectres, and uh, Assault Moving Crisis Suits, or it's indirect in Guard. And we have really efficient shooting platforms that are very slow moving in comparison. Um, then you look at other armies that want to get in your face, well, they move really quickly, but we don't really have that same durable. We have really good gun platforms, but they're slow. We don't have, we have pretty decent combat, but it's pretty non exciting to run in. So for example, warriors, they do a lot of damage. They've got a lot of attack strength, five minus two AP one, which looks amazing. T5, four up safe. If you look at that in comparison to other armies, for example, Tau, you're running around with, well, at the currently with the cyclic spam is six wound, four open vulnerable save, 18 inch moving crisis suits that can move and scoot. If you look at Eldari, which had moved into this triple scourge, triple shadow spectre, you've got six units that move between 12 and 14 inches, shoot you, and then go back behind cover. <laughs> it's very hard to fight against something that you can't see when you don't move very fast, which is why you do have to take those very mixed arms approach where if you're in invasion fleet, you kind of are forced into taking gene stealers because they move fast enough to get to these units behind terrain and they will kill them in one go. But they're also cheap enough to trade. And I think UKTC, especially from experience of ninth, having played against a lot of sisters players, is a very tradey terrain set because it's very hard, hard to hit something and then not be stood in the open or be able to be targeted in the following turn. Yeah, you're bang on. I, th I think also the armies that you address there, like Eldar and Tau, also have their own issues with like D cannons and broadsides, where they have either slow movement or slow range, and a lot of players yeah. end up reserving them. Right. So as you're saying about reserving your exocrines, them other armies that have them same issues do the same thing. Right. Mm. So maybe you saying that, like, oh, actually reserving my exocrines, being able to bring them on, get an angle, a much better angle from turn two, or maybe. If 
be able to rapid ingress them maybe when you're like, oh, actually, I'm not going to be. And then you can move eight after that actually gives you a lot more play, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. From, from that from rather than staying back there behind that l and going oh, yeah i can draw 36 but someone goes okay well you're going to move eight and then you go 36 okay so well as i move over i'm just going to stay right hug the edge of the board and you're not going to be able to shoot me this turn like and you go yeah i guess like <laughs> yeah basically yeah, right? it's so, right? yeah and without the exocrines on board your shooting is the maliceptors are okay but ap2 is an issue and 18 inch. custodies in custodies in cover is a three up and save which well, is yeah. an issue and 18 inch range exocrines are the and I'm not going to lie, they are the best shooting platform in Tyranids. Yep. Outside of Exocrines, if you don't have access to the back effects, which again suffer with a range issue and a line of sight of 24 inches, AP2, again, you need a Pyrovore to support them into this two up save cover meta. Tyranids shooting is pretty rubbish outside of the Exocrines. And I think that we unfortunately suffer. That's one of the, the issues that tyranids do have and it's not it's something that's easy to address and um, it's just something that we have to live with and we have to make alternative plans whereas a lot of armies can run around for example with a redemptor dreadnought it's a great example that jack gave it's great combat and it's great shooting and it's got a two up save it's minus one damage it kind of ticks all the boxes for what you want in, in UK how many points at the moment. Is, it? is it like two ten, two ten. Two ten. it's two a lot ten. of points yeah yeah, yeah. But it's a lot of points of good luck killing it, plus the Tetmarine oh, obviously heals it. They're so durable. Yeah. Like yeah, I fun. think I ran a triple redemptor at the first data slate tournament, the first weekend, and over five games, I think I lost three out of so three wow. on the board at a time, but I lost three total over the tournament. I was just like, oh, Tetmarine Tet Tet sits there, gets low knock, and they can be so aggressive with a two up save. Yeah. Um, we're minus one damage that can be so aggressive so that then them moving eight inches is actually not a problem like not yeah. really because they are so tough and they also have like the melee threat on top of it as well yeah. and their output's great and they, they serve all those yeah. boxes for me like playing into a, as a tyranid player playing into iron storm iron storm with like gladiators and a storm raven mm. is less scary than a triple redemptor list because when your army is reliant on damage three Damage three cuts through, like it's AP three damage three is actually a really good profile into a lot of marine vehicles because you put them on a five up save or a six up if they're not in cover. Yeah. And damage three chunks, like you can kill them very quickly. But four redemptors with. Die, right? Exactly. Whereas redemptors with armor of contempt cover and minus one damage, it's a four up save and you're already doing two damage ago. They, those things just don't fall over. And it's one of the reasons that I think Iron Storm Space Marines is quite scary when they have access to the dreadnoughts with the Tyranids. And I know we're kind of getting off the tub subject of terrain but terrain does play into that because it's very easy for you to tow a dreadnought into a ruin or put a gun barrel in a ruin i can't see it with my whole you my whole model and it's just my my damage just falls off the cliff very quickly we'll just um we'll just get through the end yeah because we, we great chat i love it but let's get through the uktc and we'll get on to wtc there's three other points i thought were quite interesting that i think about with uktc um new relictors can be placed quite safely on these terrain sets um yeah. within 12 inches of the far edge of the objective so you can you know just say to your opponent that's cool if you move on to this objective i will be able to bat try and battle shock them um so there's one thing that i think is, is really really straightforward but quite easy um the big l's have lots of different uh, levels and you can actually put gargoyles on there to deploy them and then the there's just obviously the lose some movement coming off it but actually it's not a lot um so Maybe you've got a 20 man and then a 10 man. That 10 man looks really good on that shelf because it just st stage it in a middle ruin um, at the end of turn one. Uh, and 20. Oh, yeah. So the other thing that's quite interesting you know what other faction players love doing, especially Marines? Parking transports in little mm. L's. Yeah. So little L's here. You can just park a little rhino in <laughs> there and the guys jump out, yep. your berserkers or your Sagittar parks in there. And. And it just sits in there and they think, oh, well, you can't shoot this. This is where I think, actually, and we saw it with the Invasion Fleet, um, double 20-man Termagant list that did really well the other week, is you can wrap those real good with 20 Termagants. And it's not going to kill them, so they're going to have to do something to get rid of those 20 Termagants. So, or Hormagants. So definitely something to watch out for. If you can wrap a Rhino, and then, especially if you're playing Swarm, wrap a Rhino, and then if they shoot you in combat, you can Spend the CP to surge into all other things. Like you can really cause havoc with uh, with with um, surge. But I would say one of the things I did notice playing the unending swarm is 
when you do blood surge, it can be less impactful because it's actually quite hard to get a full like a full unit hidden here. I think in other terrain sets that we're going to look at, especially WTC, mm. if you surge a unit of termagants, I think you can pretty much get them into somewhere that's unshootable. Here, boy, it's hard. Uh, you can, I think, probably after two surge moves, you'll get that hidden place. But actually, it's a little bit ropey sometimes. And they were just my thoughts on this board. I do have one question for Jack, and I don't know, you may or may not be able to answer this one. And it is terrain specific because it relates to the Neuralictor specifically. So obviously, one of the conversations that always comes up is, and, and no matter where you listen to it, you're either in the park of Neuralictors are, must include 100% of the time, or they're, they're fine and I'll take them, but otherwise, so for example, I don't take Neuralictors, I take normal Lictors at the moment because I think they present a horrible threat for a lot of armies to deal with. They allow you to pick up Technomancers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, we, between David and myself, we've spoken quite a lot about this. Um, I think Unending Swarm needs them because you, you don't get to fall back on the, the sustained hits one or army-wide lethals against those bad matchups. Um, from the, the testing you've been doing with, with the team and stuff, where where do you sit on that Neuralector thing? Because I always sit in the park of the, the meta and right now is so high leadership that most of the time the battle shock's just kind of irrelevant outside of the, the one turn you go minus one army wide. Yeah. yeah, I've actually come off that position, JP. I think that Unending Swarm doesn't need it. I think you've got okay. enough OC to try and take an objective. And actually those 80 points are better, are better spent other places. Like, again, a Lictor is actually pretty good because you can take away five and feel no pains from Necrons and things like that. Um, but yeah, no, I get your point. It's um, it's a good question, but over to Jack. No, I, I get what you're saying about the the uh, OC within within Unending Swarm. You're able to take people off there. You don't need to worry about having to uh, the minus on the battle shocks and stuff. I faced the Relictors last week, I believe. That and yeah, you're right with the leadership and stuff like that. Whereas, uh, especially with guard, I can walk up to something. I go, well, actually, if I'm going to go within twelve of this guy, I'm just going to give myself plus one leadership and stuff mm. over there. And actually, being leadership six or something like that, it's like I'm not so bad. And then with the minor, with the minus, it's like I just push myself back onto my normal leadership. I'm like, okay, I've probably failed, like get my battle shock. But also, they're pretty squishy and stuff. So they're hiding mm -hmm. like behind like those little wells and stuff. Going, okay, I'm going to hide behind this little well. I'm going. Well, actually, I probably have the range to come and come and charge them or try and deal with them a little bit better. Um, so I didn't find that they impacted me when I went against them. And uh, and I think. As Davey said in the Unending Swarm, you have enough OC to be able to mm. primary denial really well, um, so you don't need to worry about that. Maybe that extra minus on the battle shock. It does help in stuff like the guard matchup if they're nearby with the extra minus, because suddenly if you mm. shadows and you get the extra mi like the minus, or you you yep. start making people take battle shocks when they get close to you, they lose orders. Okay. Because uh, as soon as you yeah. get battle shocked, you lose your order, okay. and that can really help. Like, especially the tank commander, I've got plus one to hit. Ah, no, you don't anymore. You're back onto hitting on fours. And if they're degraded, they're hitting on fives. You know, so you can start, like, yeah. you can really start affecting, um, affecting, like, certain armies like that that are yep. reliant on not being battle shocked. Yeah, uh, we spoke so about it. Maybe that situation more. Maybe that's something more for a yeah. team's aspect to go, actually, I'm going to put it into certain armies, and this is what they're going to be able to do as a, as a counter threat. Mm. No, it's, it's interesting because obviously just looking at a lot of the lists that are that are that are on the um, the Manchester this coming weekend, the, the majority is neuroelectors, and it's just interesting to see because obviously a lot of them are geared towards looking at how they're going to perform in teams. It's just interesting mm -hmm. to see see that choice, especially with that points increase. Because I'm very personally very high on lectors. I like the fact that it sits in cover, and your opponent goes, "I'm not going to charge this because it has six, seven minus two damage, two fight first attack for so, no, sixty exactly. points." It's gonna going to chop you like, up first. Do you want to, like, it will kill, yeah. like, even if it gets charged by custodians, which is the worst case scenario, you still kill a custodian guard. You maybe kill two if you spike it. It's got a decent profile against them. Mm. But I was, no, I was just interested how the, how you, how the people have come to the conclusion, because obviously with the points increase on Neuralictors, it's been a big change. But it's that's a really helpful answer, to be fair. JP, because hmm? we know that the next two books are, what, Tau and Orcs? Yes. Mm. Not the exactly. best leadership. Um, no, they're not. So maybe watch this space on those. But also the neuroelectors don't really do a lot of damage into them. It's I suppose it's target priority, right? And I think it's um I think the, the big thing with um with having neuroelectors was always that if there was a tanky target and it had bad leadership, you could try and snipe it out and get the better wounding. But at the moment, like the stuff it's pretty killable still. Like Custodius oh, yeah. wounding on threes. It's interesting. It was it was just a, it was one that came to mind because obviously I know that some of the guys are, are 
trying to work out what they're doing for some of these bigger team events. So it's kind of quite interesting to see where the take's been from that. I think that's with with teams testing it is an overload of primary denial because yes. you want to start pushing differentials. I think yep. it's you know if you can get that primary denial uh, with a couple extra neuro lictors and stuff in the list uh, on top of having a lot of them like OC two battle line units, you just you can really squeeze like your opponent's army and go okay you're yeah. going to get five ten points on primary in this game and then I'm going to get my max primary and I'm going to go like fixed object like fixed objectives yes. and actually you can start pushing differentials a lot more okay. against uh, especially against certain armies that can get trapped in their deployment zone mm-hmm. um but and good they're, not, they're not even scoring their deployment zone if you just like can you know, push yourself up against them you know behind a bunch of screens as well where they actually can't get to the electors as well yeah. I do, I do think that's an interesting look at it. Actually, that difference mm-hmm. between teams and singles, where this these... pushing differential rather than just getting that one yeah. point win, it's going. Actually, I'm going to squeeze out. No, I'm not making you score any primary because I want to yes. push like you know 12, 13 points, like yeah, yeah. wins in a differential setting rather than I just need to win this game by a point. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah no, for sure. Cool. No, it's really helpful. It's really interesting. Very cool. Thanks for the insight, chat. All right, nice. Um, let's look at WTC terrain. So. I won't lie, I've played on this once at a team's tournament, and it was cray. I took a monster mash list, and I really enjoyed it, actually. But this was when towering was actually, I think, still like the big thing, so it was kind of terrifying going into nights. Um, but yeah, I've, uh, I'll hand over to Jack here, because he has probably more expertise than me and JP put together on this terrain set. WTC, probably my favourite terrain at the moment. Uh, mostly because I'm having to test on it for Home Nations. But it's like I think when you're it, you start off with your army construction, uh, not your army construction, sorry, your team construction, because you're mostly playing WTC on teams rather than singles. So if you're playing uh, a nid list, you go, am I going big monsters? Am I going unending swarm, two hundred and forty gaunts and gargoyles and stuff like that? You're trying to fill a role of what does that list want to do first. Um, and is it and is it like a counter to certain armies? Does it need protecting? So the fact that on every mission you have eight different tables, you you sometimes have armies that need protecting because they have to play on certain tables. And I think Nids, with its flexibility and its codex between uh, mo- big monsters and little bugs and stuff like that, is one of the few armies that is able to actually play on a lot of the tables. And some of like the free story ruins and stuff like that is perfect for stuff like gargoyles you know if you look at like lukas galenka's list from poland where he has the 60 gargoyles you can start some of them in deep strike and you can start doing that like full like that filter of okay i'm gonna have 20 gargoyles behind this big three-story l they're gonna run out they're gonna die i can bring them back deep strike i can like i can deep strike another unit back onto that l put it on the free story ruin and it's not getting shot for the rest of the game unless someone has indirect there's uh it's so much more dense even on the light boards and certain armies uh you look at this heavy board here top right look how like how much you can screen out there but also if you put an pop an exocrine behind say that little blue that blue ruin on the top, bottom left on the top right map you can actually move out eight get on the objective and then start seeing down towards the middle objective so actually not only can you hide your army, but you can actually move out and start getting angles on people as well. It's like a it's a really nice balance of both. Um, but you're also you're looking at what your list does in the team. Does it need protecting on a heavy board? You know, if you're going full swarm, if you ran on a heavy board so that nothing ever died or anything like that, that would be that's really like that's really good. But you couldn't run the monsters on there because what are they getting? They're not getting the exocrines aren't getting the angles on certain boards um so again like you were saying jp oh is that a map where i have to start bringing in stuff from strat reserves instead but realistically i think i really like the fact you can hide potentially your whole army um especially with like a big swarm list on this terrain whereas i think on uktc you struggle to put 20 gargoyles behind a medium l because they're so big whereas here you you can you know you're gonna hide that many models like they are big with their wings sticking out and stuff they are um they are big models when they're in big units like that and i think this terrain has that advantage maybe over uktc where you know you put 20 in the big l on uktc and then you can't fit your other models anywhere else like because you can't put another unit of 20 behind a medium l because it doesn't get uh doesn't get to hide someone can move out go first and shoot the unit 
uh, I think, on, yeah, WTC, it's a little bit better for that stuff, uh, especially when you're looking at NIDs as well. But again, it's all about the role of what you want that army to do. Um, there's a lot of staging points as well. You look at some of these maps, these are Hammer and Anvil. If you were deployed behind some of these ruins, turn one or turn like you can hide between another ruin and then not get shot as well. Like there's a lot more staging points than there is on UKTC. Whereas UKTC, you that you said before, you can move to that medium L or that little L in the middle, but realistically you're not going to hide 20 models behind that. And you, as you said, once you start playing that trading game on that terrain, you start. When you trade a unit, you know you're going to get shot back on here. I think mm. on this, especially with like overrun as well, you can actually get behind some of these terrains and then become like untargetable for certain armies that can't dig you out of them bits. Yeah. Maybe it, it, it plays more to the melee as well of like warriors and stuff like that. Maybe you, you can start leaning into some certain um, extra units that you can't run on UKTC. Yeah, I was looking at num the heavy number 31 and just thinking yeah. like that looks like either or like if you're a custodies player, that looks like a map. You're like, yes, I'd love to sit on this one because I can just sure. stage my entire army in the middle of the board Absolutely. and project a load of threat. But the same goes for nids can do the same thing. Exactly. You can and, do exactly the same thing. And I definitely think, like you say, I think one of the big things with um, Tyranids um, that I've found is a lot of the army construction is terrain based. Like there are some staples that you need, like the the triple exocrine seems to exist no matter what terrain you set on because it's so efficient, thirty six inches, etc. This interest, like you say, like you know, I look at some of these maps and I go, hmm, six warrior, six melee warriors with a prime have got some really good staging points, and also if they're then an invasion fleet, for example, I can hit something and then jump back behind the wall, which then forces if my opponent wants to try and trade out with that to then stand in the open versus three exocrines. So having that that melee punch. Is a lot better is a lot easier to have access to because you can hide it mm. and it and if you look say for example on 30 uh table th number 31 that bottom sort of double l is such yeah, a nice, nice angle that you can put a unit behind there mm. and you can't get to them and it's i i've i've always so wanted can to walk through that bit right because the perspex you can walk yes. through the over the perspex and just around the actual ruin itself so what you could do is you can hide you can hide like a Carnifex behind there. Yeah. Behind that little L, you can hide a Carnifex. I'm not going to get shot, but if you go on this bottom objective here on table 31, I'm just going to move straight through the perspex around the terrain and I can charge you. And yes. then I know, no, you're not on it. And now I've got this big monster bug on your objective here yeah. and I can just stay here. And so if ever you're going to come here, I'm going to come basically, uh, it, there's a great counter threat with certain bits like that. And the perspex really helps Mm. the extra bit so if you took all the perspex away from here it, it, you'd really struggle i think to start hiding that but that the yes. perspex is is really what sets it apart and i think uh when we go into gw terrain that we will see that again mm -hmm. the perspex starts breaking um breaking normal shooting angles that you yeah. might otherwise get on uktc where you don't have that that yeah. extra bit i've i've never actually had the pleasure of playing on wtc or gw terrain and I'm always, I've always wanted to and always been interested to, just never had the chance the, for reasons that I'm not on a team for a WTC. <laughs> this is probably the best example I could give, but it's always been really interesting, like you say, that, that perspex difference. It's not just the ruin, it's that added footprint that's a lot larger than the ruin. And mm. it just looks like a lot more of a challenge to try and build a list that can function on, as you say, any of these terrain setups, which Tyranids, in a way, really can do with the mixed arms approach but it'd be interesting to see how that could differentiate to teams like trying warriors trying gene stealers because you have those staging points that yeah. you for 10 gene stealers and a brood lord is a big footprint mm -hmm. but big footprints can also hide on these terrain pieces a lot more easily than uktc which is super interesting yeah. Uh, Davey, he's on mute, gone, isn't he? He's gone mute, mate. You've gone mute. You've muted yourself. <laughs> there you go. It's this newfangled <laughs> technology they've all handed out to them, and half of them are on mute. Oh, no, still can't hear him. It's fine, Jack. It's mine in uh, your pod. It's mine in your stream now. We'll take over Bug Watch. Bug yeah. Watch JP. Um, <laughs> we, don't need we don't need your voice, Wizzly, anymore. He's literally just disappeared from the world. Um, so, Going okay, well, we might as well talk about terrain while we're on. Obviously, it's bug watch mm -hmm. episode. So, going into this, um, do you when you because obviously you say that the, it's team construction versus um, army list construction is yep. where you start. 
are you does are you there's obviously Tyranids as you've described a kind of it's a nice, it's a really good army it's it's a good defender army it doesn't have horrendous matchups because mm -hmm. it scores secondaries really easily because of the viable one two. But it, yeah, yeah we can hear him again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's oh, back. There we go. Um, we'll have our own conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to figure out how to turn the volume up on this stream because uh, Michael T, thank you very much for uh, pointing out this. The sounds kind of low at the moment. Uh, so the best way I can think of to turn up the volume is for us all to just talk louder because I don't yep. know how okay. to do it. <laughs> That's fine. We can <laughs> okay, do that. We'll try our best. Um, do, do you find that obviously because you, you, as you said, you go through team construction or army mm -hmm. choice versus list construction? Does that? Yep. Because uh, one of the big things we discussed is terrain does make a difference. Mm. When you go to to WTC, obviously you have your meta staple armies that you want to yep. have in everything. Yep. Once you get past those first two or three, mm -hmm. how does the terrain then make you want to start building the next three or four armies? You you need to start thinking about them them top one two three. Do they need to, do they need table choice so that's when i think that's when the defenders actually come up like that's a defender list because they they become a defender list because they need kind of protecting they need the table choice so you see that with black templars uh tank spam they can't get put as an attacker because the defender's just going to choose a heavy board then what are you going to do you're not going to run around your your lances and your reapers around corners and stuff it's just not going to work so they need they become a, a defender because they need the table choice. They need to be put on like certain medium boards and mostly light boards. Um, and I think as you get towards the end of the, the end of the eight, you start identifying a couple lists that are going okay. They're kind of needing to be babysit a little bit in the pairings, not because they're matchups, but because they are their table and terrain um, dependent. That their matrix can really swing in that respect from uh from table to table and i don't think nids is one of them choices i think nids uh you think about teams you go oh, it's def i guess a defender because it can blunt any army right because of the amount of like um oc it can have and the like the durability sometimes of the monsters it can pretty much hold a lot of armies at least to a draw maybe not like pushing pushing wins on certain armies as well but realistically they're a great attacker for that role as well because you don't mind what board people put you on if people put you on this heavy board you'd be like yeah great but if also people put you on a light board you'll still see the same things like we look at the medium like three at the bottom you can hide a majority of your army on that top left hand corner and then be able to move up turn one and hide behind that massive l with a load of stuff and again or you can move down to the middle and hide behind that l because of the perspex 12 inches long you're able to cover multiple units behind that so you can have a unit actually behind the terrain itself like behind on the perspex then you can have a unit behind the perspex itself and then suddenly you've got two units around there uh being able to stage and i think nids are a very good attacker choice in that respect uh that they can prey on armies um especially if they go first i think on wtc where they can really pressure like with unending swarm uh they can really push people back into the into the deployment zones and then suddenly just lift their whole army up behind these staging points and going Ah, no, no primary for you this game yeah like that's it i'm just they can play the trading game of just primary trading because they'll just bring back that unit that came back uh and then that comes back and they'll just keep can just keep doing that for five turns eventually maybe your your opponent will get on the objective if they go second on the last turn and that's their that's the only scoring they're getting apart from their cards and because they do fixed so well as well uh if you take a couple biovores um being able to do homers and cleanse potentially or homers and engage, depending on the map, uh, depending on the mission as well. Um, they can really, they're a really good attacker choice, I think, with on this terrain because mm -hmm. the it doesn't, they don't really care about the board. I don't think. I think they can work, um, and with the army list construction, they can work fairly well. Depending, uh, like no matter what army they bring. Like I guess if you bring two hundred and forty like models you're always yeah. going to struggle right you're like it's always you can't hide the whole thing you're going to have to put a lot in reserve but then you're going to have that like you, it doesn't matter if you're the defender and you have to choose the board even on a heavy board you're not hiding the whole thing um but it fills a role and it fills a role and i think nids fill a, fill a role of being able to push some of them um blunt some of them matchups oh he's gone no yeah, he's gone again uh, there you go, gone. uh they they do fill a role of being able to blunt some of them top armies um just through primary denial and stuff and then wtc 
uh, the boards really help that. Oh, no, absolutely. He's main. He's the main guy now. <laughs> there we go. I've gone through an absolute nightmare trying to get this sorted. I can't figure out how to do the sound. <laughs> Never mind. I'll get John Scrivens to fix it for me. Yeah. I'm not sure if I was just repeating myself a lot. No, there, no, you weren't. But, it, but it's, um, yeah, I think it just offers so much staging, like so much more staging points from here. And um, it really benefits an army like Nids. And I think that's why we've been seeing it do so well at teams events currently uh, at eight mans and five man teams on this terrain. That's really good. Nice. No, that's, that's all the questions I had for this one. Yeah. Um... I won't, I won't make you repeat anything, Jack, because uh, I, I was sorry. I was just I was away with the fairies there trying to fix the sound, but we'll uh, we'll get that one sorted for next time. We do have another terrain set to go on to, though. Um, and of course, if you have any questions for Jack, please put them in the chat. We know that the UTC terrain is a hot as f topic. Um, moving on to the next terrain set, we have GW terrain. So GW terrain, funny one. Uh, the guys pointed out yesterday, GW made an entirely new terrain set and then didn't make it purchasable. No, no. Uh, you can't buy this train. You have to make it or kind of figure it out your own way. Um, but actually, I've played on it a couple of times. Have you played on it at all, Jack? Not at all. Not at all. Not and at you all. haven't played on it, JP? No, nope, not at all. So I played on it at the start of the edition when Tarion was a thing, when uh, when Aaron and I popped over to Barcelona for a GT, uh, which was pretty cool. And, um, I mean, we, had, we were rabbits in headlights. It was a new edition, new terrain, new rules. We had no idea. We just played through, but it was quite fun. But the towering rail was a disaster. Like, it was so, so rough that you could just shoot anything they wanted. Um, but it was interesting. I have since played on a um, version of it at the Goonhammer Open. And I have to say, you know what? Breath of fresh air. I love UKTC, but um, but but uh, to quote Lewis yesterday, variety is the spice, spice of life. And uh, getting to play on a new terrain set was really interesting. Um I think I think some of the things that really stand out for me on this terrain set is the little pieces here. So um, can you see that where it has a little T on it in the middle, like it looks yep. like a letter T, um, or a C on the in each deployment zone? Uh, those little pieces, uh, monsters can go over those because it's only it's like less than two inches tall or something. Mm -hmm. So monsters can go over those, uh, which means things like flying hive tyrants become mm -hmm. things because they're obs they're obscuring to use that word, um, and you can't shoot the hive tyrant behind it but the hive tyrant can fly through it at 14 inches or whatever wherever have you um and um and, and, and actually impact the game late game rather than trying to get around a massive l also other monsters can just blast through them so you can hide a monster and it can just walk straight through which just makes like as john was saying before makes their threat range so much more viable to a game like you don't um it doesn't take you three turns to get a monster involved in the game properly. It can take you one turn. You can even use it as a counter punch. If mm -hmm. someone's in your deployment zone, if you've got something behind that wall, it just goes, eh, and it's there and it's dealing with it. Yeah. So that's my favorite thing about GW terrain. And not just for nids. Like if you're, if you're a Marine player and you want to play tanks, if, um, or, or, you know, another large thing that can't breach through terrain, like I think it does open up that option for a lot of people which makes it a lot more fun i suppose in that sense um approaching the center is pretty good here as well right because there's mm -hmm. so many pieces of terrain that block it yeah. um, you can just move into the center i'm thinking if you're playing dawn of war here sorry not dawn of war uh, hammer and anvil or mm -hmm. even um corner deployment like getting into the middle is reasonably easy without your opponent getting angles which is quite nice um and uh yeah that's pretty good the flanks are open though look at the flanks right super mm. crazy uh mm. down each side so not too dissimilar to wk w uh uktc in that sense um but that 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 middle is a and the, the middle of the board is an absolute murder box as well right mm -hmm. you try taking that middle objective if you take it you you know mm. your opponent's got to get in there and dig you out of it i think that's where um a lot of these melee armies have really benefited i do remember that I think it was one of the US events where there was first and second place for both custodies armies. And this was post nerf custodies when they were a bit rubbish, just because you could stage and they were really hard to get out of the middle of the board on GW because you had that staging capability. But also, once you got in the middle, you that couldn't just get shot out of the middle. Yeah. You, if people wanted to shoot you, 
they had to walk within about 12 inches of you and then you could go cool well i'll just if you don't kill me i'm in combat with you yeah so i think that was a big thing for melee armies like this, this format even though like you say those firing lanes down the side are pretty potent once you're in the middle those firing lanes cease to exist in the same way and it's more of right how do i dig out this these 10 wardens or how do i dig out these 10 death Row terminators or how do i even dig out 20 to 40 primaris crusaders from black templars just because there's so many wounds you can't do it with shooting and they are quite they are resilient enough to take a hit on the chin and then hit you back just as hard absolutely and i think you, it's i'll oh, go on jack uh, do you think this terrain is like um it's like a kind of mix of like mm. not like not like flight but a mix of uktc wtc in terms of like you got the firing lanes of UKTC, but you've also got the perspex and the ability to like, yeah. again, as you said, like Carnifex is hiding behind a perspex, being able to then just walk straight through it and then being mm. able to do like extra, um, being able to just get rid of their movement debuffs of going around terrain and then being out in the open, they can actually start hiding and, and uh, uh, staging up before they do that. But also you do have them, as you said, them massive firing lanes from, from side to side, potentially if you want it. So it's like a kind of like medium between UKTC, WTC ish. Kind of like it has bits of bits of both a little bit. Obviously yeah. like, yeah, like I think you're right, a yeah. mix of both. But the but the the way the terrain interacts with the board. Yes. I would agree. I think as well, I think you're right. I, I, the 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 terrain here is I think a bit more spread out as well, right? Than WTC mm. and UKTC. I think UKTC can be guilty a little bit of cramming all the terrain pieces in the middle, and mm. then those corners are always open, right? Those there's mm, always yeah. like a corner that you can't really screen against um, unless you're out in the open yourself. Exactly. Like exactly. Yes. Yeah. Whereas here, you could put a Ripper Swarm, a Lictor, a Spore mm. Mine in one of those corner pieces, and that's half, like what, nearly a quarter of the board screen. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. There is a lot to be said about that kind of stuff here as well. I do think this terrain reduces the impact of loan off a little bit, though, because yep. um, with, that, yeah. with, with that big lump in the middle, actually, if someone's got an angle on you, they're, they're not prob they're probably not that far away from being within 12 mm. inches of you. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree. It, the, 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 at this point, it's like, depending on where the objectives are, loan ops come in very useful for holding down against, say, guard artillery, mm -hmm. where that is a threat because... It, it, it the the middle of the board when you have a lot of artillery is really good for you but at the same time it's i, I do agree that loan up in a board where everything's very close quarters and the firing line firing lanes don't exist outside of some very specific positions then yeah i, I do agree that loan up probably has less of an impact and you're probably more looking at what does the loan up bring to my army mm. versus just having it because then it can't die i think that's a really interesting one for this mesh this this map specifically a little cool. different to hear, like when you have like a, a Calidus Assassin or whatever on UKTC, that middle, there's usually like a six inch away, f away from the middle gap where you go, I'm going to sk stick this guy just behind this, this ruin. Whereas yep. here, you don't have that. If you want to mm -hmm. stick a guy to do homers, like they're, they're going to die. Like they, you know, they, there's not really like a six inch away from that where they can go and hide in a ruin without. Mm -hmm being on the perspex and being able to be seen as soon as someone else goes and touches their perspex. Yep. Yeah, that cute little play with area denial as well, where you just put something 100%. there and go, well, maybe yes. they get area you denial. You just can't do that on here. Can't do no, that on, on this map specifically, yeah. Yeah, and I, I do think, like you say, it's very much, uh, it, it, does, it does benefit armies that want to brawl in the middle of the board For and sure. not just get shot off. Uh, I do think that's not a bad thing. I think that's why potentially GW Terrain has had a um, quite a positive feedback because it does mean that those armies that want to get into combat like orcs and stuff uh have a lot more chance of actually making combat before dying uh to the random to the gun line gun lanes that do exist in, in other train that's sets not great for us though, right that's not great for us we 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 like going somewhere and dying uh like <laughs> you know, your gene stealers your warriors we go to a place and then we don't make it back like yeah. we go into the middle like someone comes in and just cleans us straight out um I mean, orders, as you say, can stand there and go, oh, oh okay, right, yeah. I'm going to hit you again. Resilient, resilient combat armies do benefit from this. I do, I do think that this is a board where I'd be very interested in taking a couple of bricks of G of Tyranid warriors and running them in the middle with the prime and, and seeing what what was left at the end of it. But Carnifex no, is an old one eye. Yes, exactly. Carnifex old one eye. Absolutely. They brawl really well in the middle of the board. They you don't want to tag a Carnifex in combat because next turn it shoots shoots the yeah. shoots the life out of you because it's in combat and. 
yeah, I, I think they've it's got, uh, got the surge as well, right? They've got the yes, surge. they have. The... So if you just try and shoot them with any kind of like, you know, you get try and get them angles or indirect tries to shoot them, it's going yeah. to move forward, I guess. Like, yes, and might accidentally end up in combat with you. Then yeah. old one eye eats you alive. <laughs> I think I think for me, I, I would be more inclined to try and sit on my tens. Hopefully, this is not taking hold. I'd try and sit on my <laughs> ten. Yeah. Mm. And move block the middle from my deployment zone for the entire game. <laughs> like, yeah. I just think Swarm player rivers. Uh, yeah, yeah. You don't. <laughs> you you just play that. a game that doesn't. We're just me and Jack are living the life of killing opponents' armies. You live this life of. <laughs> I stopped you scoring. Yeah, I did my job. Guys, you're having too much fun. I need to st- just take that away <laughs> and say no. Here's twenty gargles wrapping your <laughs> exactly. The um. But no, it's it's very interesting. The blood swarm, I think. Sorry, the the surge is actually quite good in this mm. one, though, because it, yes. again, it gives you there's lots all these terrain pieces like the WTC of large surface areas that you can hide uh, mm. units that are going to blood surge from, mm. right? And again, like we said before, if, if you're going to get an angle on something to shoot it, you're probably quite close to it, and therefore a surge might just touch you, and then you you know you're For in sure. a different mm. type of problem. Mm. Yeah, um, I'm not a big fan of this with Vanguard onslaught. Um, I quite like I quite like Vanguard onslaught on on UKTC, except for Purge of the Four and except mm-hmm. for Hammer and Anvil, which don't get me wrong is two of the three missions. Um, yeah. But on here and in, as well WTC, all this you know, um, loan up and and things like that, it kind of becomes less impactful. I do like the mm-hmm. advance and charge there. I do like the um, the two CP reactive move for mm-hmm. two units. In these kind of places, because you can get yes. out of the way if you need to, but I think the strongest strat is the loan up strat, and mm-hmm. and it just doesn't feel very good on this. Um, invasion fleet feels pretty good, I think. Um, invasion fleet always feels good. It's kind yeah, of the does, benefit yeah. of having a five that feel no pain. Yeah, funny that, isn't it? Yeah, funny that. But I do like the I overrun think... here as well. I think so we... probably an underrated, yeah. under underused strategy. If you, I don't know if you think. I think I think the thing I like the most of just about invasion fleet is. In singles, it's the most a it's the most forgiving, um, yeah. but also just has that spiky output. Like, like Jack was saying, like in in singles events, you have to win by one point, and in teams, you want to win by as much as possible. So squeezing it out with that primary denial, although you're not necessarily going to do as much damage, you might find that unending swarm fits the bill better than invasion fleet because invasion fleet generally does win games more than unending swarm, but you are looking at like one to ten point wins mm-hmm. because. You, Stuff's going to die. You don't have that same primary denial. Yes, your output's a lot stronger. Um, and that's probably why I've probably m- moved more to it than Unending Swarm. But it doesn't give you the same in teams. And I think it's, um, I think that's why Invasion Fleet will always exist as a really good detachment. Because it's a little bit easier to play. It's a little bit more forgiving. But it also um, you're, it doesn't matter if you win by one point or you, you win by 100 points. It's exactly yeah. the same. Whereas Unending Swarm, you are really trying to do that points differential. Mm-hmm. Which is where it really shines. The the one thing that is quite interesting about this terrain set, I don't know if you agree, is every terrain piece is quite narrow, and it's all got holes in. It's all weird, weird, and got holes in and gaps in and things like that. Your exocrine's quite a long model, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. the whole tenth edition thing of you have to be entirely within a terrain piece to be able to shoot through it. Mm. There's so I can't see a piece of terrain on this map that you can't stick the nose of a of an exocrine through. If you really wanted to, and not have to be wholly within the terrain. So, for example, where the two pieces of terrain are kind of touching corner to corner, yeah. you can mm-hmm. stick it through the center there. But even um, some of these terrain pieces, like the big one um, in the middle, the larger piece, you can absolutely get the nose of an exocrine uh, gun just through that gap and just go boom, I can see you. Right? It, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I think that's one of the other things I found on the Goonhammer terrain, mm-hmm. uh, which is very similar to this. Is that lovely corner to corner piece is is just great for being able to just go, okay, I want to shoot through there now. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um and then yeah, I, th- I think overall, actually to be honest, I think this could be my favorite terrain set. I really did enjoy it. Mm. Uh, I'll have to go to America to play on it again, I think. Yeah. Um maybe or, I mean, see, it or do Warhammer Fest. It was Goonhammer, right? So I'm mm. sure Goonhammer team, the Goonhammer team optimized it to be a bit better. But I would like to tr- play on classic GW open terrain. You'll have to be a Warhammer Fest, won't you? I think that's where it will next be. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. It'll be interesting to see. I'm sure I'll appreciate UKTC afterwards, but um, but yeah, maybe a WTC event, Jack. Um, do you know anyone <laughs> that, that use that terrain in the UK? 
that people might want to go to? So go Scrivo to will also be able to say this a lot that um, that Team Wales do a lot of fundraisers and there's mm. a lot of like WTC terrain like teams events of like teams of five, six to eight, to eight, five, six to eight kind of like teams where you can have non-national teams uh, go to go to some of these events. Um, or alternatively, like that's where national teams start to test players. So if you mm. decide to apply next year, like there was like 35 applicants this year for England, not obviously everyone's going to get on the team, but people were able to join. Like I think we took three teams to a tournament in Nottingham yep. uh, of six mans. So everyone's going to be able to go there and start playing on WTC terrain. Um, even if you end up don't go, uh, don't get on the team or anything like that, you'll be in a round yep. that you're getting surrounded with WTC stuff. Uh, stat check. The, uh, they run a vibe check league in their Discord mm -hmm. um, for patrons that join there. That so you can join. Um, so it's basically like five rounds, I think, all, all on WTC terrain, uh, and it's all measured in differential scoring as well. Mm -hmm. oh, nice. So uh, you can just ten ten draw with people if you only win by five points. Um, so that's a different outlook, but you also get, and it's a TTS only, but it's but you still get exposure to WTC terrain uh, in the singles format. And then obviously War Masters itself, the mm -hmm. uh, the event before WTC, with a, like 250 players, I think it is, 300 yeah, players. Yeah, I think a few of the guys. Single one. A lot. Yeah, it's a singles event, but it is on WTC terrain. Yeah. Um, and I think I think honestly, with the like the popularity of team as teams has surged so much in the last year that people are wanting to get hold of WTC terrain. It just ends up because you have to buy the perspex as well, so mm. like. TOs, you know, you have to spend 150 pounds on every piece of terrain when you already own like mm -hmm. a, a X amount of UKTC like tables and stuff like that. So there are a few things, but Scrivo would be able to like drop some things maybe in the Discord, Six Plus Plus Discord, of yeah. like events yeah. coming up that the Team Wales guys do for their fundraisers. Um, because they def there is definitely like abundance of WTC terrain around North Wales and like Manchester ish, like people play Element Element the Warlords to, uh, yes. events as well. They yeah, they're the teams events, but they are um, all on WTC terrain and they're great. They're great events. They're really good people up in that part of the world as well. Yeah, it was a really good event. I really enjoyed it actually. Um, although here's my hot take: is I well, hate teams. I love you teams. Do, you You're do, wrong. Yeah, I am wrong. I'm probably wrong. I think I'm you are wrong. Teams, maybe, teams maybe is you the should best be on way my team. Oh, I'll, I'll get, we'll go on the team together. I'll change your, uh, yeah. change your mind. Okay. I'll change your mind. I'll change your I, will, mind. I will hold my hands up. I've played ITT every single year. It's my favorite event of the year. I just think teams is the best way to play Warhammer. Singles stresses me out and causes yeah. me so much anxiety. Honestly. I think like, I think one of the, I think one of the big things is there are there are like the last ITT we went to. I ba the team basically said, well, we've got a World Eaters player who can't beat CSM. We need someone who's going to run into the CSM bus. I'm like, cool, I will, because I'm fairly confident in my matchup versus CSM. Played it three times, crushed all of them. Yeah. I did my job. And I really enjoyed being on a team where I was given a job and succeeded. And I think that's mm -hmm. kind of one of the things I enjoy about team. Teams is yeah. that you, you're, do, you're, you're not just playing for yourself. You're playing for the team. But also, when it does go wrong... And you do have a bad game. The dice are against you. All the cards are. You've got four other people there who are just going to go. Hey, it's all good. Like he just crushed them twenty zero, and it doesn't matter. So it's less of a personal impact. You can focus more on having more fun around other people. You can have fun losing games. You can as well. Like Dan just put in the uh, in the in the comment section there. I remember we we played a teams event with him once, and I was like, oh, I'm predicted to get a two here. I was getting proper battered, and then I brought back a five. Mm. And it won us the round, and we won the event. And it was just like, but the ecstatic, or like the the emotion of everyone just going, "You brought back five points, and we win the round." And it was just like, and it's like I lost. I lost by like yeah. how many ever points, like thirty odd points, whatever it is. Mm. But the team won because of yes. because of this because of this result. Mm. Uh, so you don't look at it as like I've lost the game. I've like I've brought back points for my team, and yes. the team's won. So it's like completely, um, it's just a completely different way of thinking. Yeah, and I really like that. It's a completely different way of thinking about 40k, and it takes the stress of of winning and losing away, which I think sometimes I can put on a singles respect. Like I go, oh, I need to go, I need to go four and one at this tournament. Or I need to like go, like you need to do this or X and uh, like, and it's just like ah, oh, that's so much pressure to put on yourself sometimes. 
Uh, that's the some, that's the only thing I just dis, like dislike about singles. But that's a, mm. it's a personal choice as well. It's oh, a yeah, personal absolutely. choice for sure. Absolutely, you are you are both doing a great job of selling it. I have to say. Um, cool. Well, that's it for us. Uh, only a full half an hour over what we thought we were going to do. <laughs> but the chat was that good. We 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 can't stop. Right. It was a really good, really good. Thank you very much for coming on, Jack, and of course, John. Thank you very much as well. Extra sp- oh, two extra special guests. <laughs> Sorry, JP. <laughs> it's all right. Um, <laughs> um, great, cool. Well, of course, if you have any comments, any questions, uh, come and drop it in our Discord or put it in the chat, in the comments rather, uh, for this video. Um, and yeah, we'll see you in two weeks when we do uh, Bug Watch Stats go, Stats go Regular on a Monday. We'll see you then. Have a good one. Ta-ra for now.